Father God, you are so good to us, Lord. We are so undeserving of it. Everything we have in this life, Lord, just this environment to grow up together as one body in Christ. Our family, Lord, our houses. Just, Lord, living every single day, Lord. Yet, we still continue to sing against you. So, Father, at this time, we ask that you allow us to serve very nature for you, Lord. That you allow us to sing. So you can bring down our soul. So we can do all things for you, Lord. Knowing that following you, knowing that praising you is better than anything else in this world. So Lord, thank you so much. We love you. And grow us in your son. by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I just invite you the next couple minutes to bring your sin before the Lord, before the cross, acknowledging that uh, although we claim Christ with our lips and our minds and our hearts, that we still live in sin each and every week. And so just come once again to the cross and find this forgiveness and healing on you this morning. So let's pray. Give our guests the heart and yearning to pursue an active and intentional church membership. 
whether with our church or a different church. Lord, the church is not the answer or solution for our lives. You are Jesus, but the church is what you have considered so great that you would be willing to lay your own life down for it. The church is the bride of Christ, won by your sacrifice and your blood on that cross. So may we increase in consideration of how precious your church is to you, so that we may also increase in consideration of how precious your church should be to us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' beautiful and precious name. Amen. All right, good morning. Welcome. It's Memorial Day weekend, so uh, some people are out of town, but uh, would you get up this morning and just say hi, greet those around you? If it's your first time here, first time seeing someone, say hi to them, you know, so have a time of a greeting. You may never have to fear the dentist chair again, thanks to this revolutionary piece of candy. Painful inflamed receding gum. less of a bop of a song this morning than we've played in the past, but you know, it's still good, it's still good. All right, if you have your Bibles, we are in Matthew 25, so turn there, 25, 26, 27, 28, four more chapters, four more chapters. We're in Matthew 25, verses 1 through 30, 1 through 30. We're talking today this morning about this idea of actively waiting, of waiting and working, these kinds of things as Jesus talks to us. I hope that you find it's good. His word is good. So Matthew 25, verses 1 through 30. And before we jump into the word, uh, let me just lift us up in prayer one more time. So let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for this time. Lord, we thank you for just the incredible blessing it is to gather together like this as a church, as one body. Uh, Lord, during this time, as we spend time in your word, would you show to us just how powerful, how supernatural, how otherworldly, how holy your word is, O God. There is nothing that is like it on this earth. It has power. It can convict. It can correct. It can save. It can change. It can heal. And so, Lord God, would you accomplish your goals this morning in the preaching of your word and the listening of your word. Give us increased alertness to just be able to Uh, be refreshed to have new energy this morning as we listen to your word. And Lord, give us the insight to be able to look into our own lives and reflect on uh, what you may be leading us to change, what you may be leading us to surrender, and where we can grow in our faith towards you, Lord Jesus, this morning. And so we need your help and with Holy Spirit, and we pray all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, Matthew 25, verses 1 through 30. Uh, Just a short disclaimer, and this reminds me of, uh, if you didn't know, back in the day, way, way back in the day when the scriptures were written and the scriptures were being shared, uh, primarily it was an oral scripture, but then also oral meaning that they were read aloud. They weren't really scrolls. There were some, uh, but they were recorded later on down the line. But essentially, when the scriptures were written, these chapter divisions and verse divisions and passage divisions didn't exist. And uh, the person who was reading would just kind of keep going until probably he wouldn't cut off in the middle of an idea if he had any idea what he was doing. But he would finish one idea and then they would talk about it or discuss it or listen to it. And I say all that because Matthew 24, if you remember our, our discussion, it was Jesus talking about how Uh, the temple will be destroyed, about how Jesus will come again. And so we talked even last week about uh, Jesus returning and how we can await this kind of second coming of Christ. And today, this morning, we find ourselves in a continuation uh, of what we talked about even last week. So I felt like I couldn't preach a a chapter plus 30 verses last week in 30 minutes. We would have been here for way too long and it would have been way too difficult. Uh, So it's kind of a continuation of our message last week. It's kind of along the same idea. uh, And if we had the time or the ability, we would have done it all in one chunk. 
possibly. But today we're talking about this idea of actively waiting, this idea of waiting and working. And so it's a little different enough that I think we can tackle it this morning. But Jesus is talking to his people about what we are to do as we wait for him to come back, how we are to wait, what is the way uh, that we are to wait in this life. And so just to start off with this morning, uh, think about a period of waiting in your life. Uh, if you had any you know, major or minor periods in your life where you were just had to wait either for something else, a government entity, for work, for a job, for whatever. Uh, and this idea that we're talking about today of active and passive waiting, right? And so just to give us a short idea before we get into it, I think that when we examine scripture, we can find the healthy line. It's kind of like a scale or a balance or a spectrum. And somewhere along down the middle is where we're called to be as Christians, not being too active in our waiting and not being too passive in our waiting. So for example, uh, I thought about searching for a job, right? If you've ever had to search for a job before, I, I don't know how you tend to look for work or for look for jobs. Maybe you're the type that is very passive, right? You just kind of sit there, maybe submit one application or two to places, and then primarily it's word of mouth, right? Your friends know that you're looking for a job, and so you're blessed to have great friends in your life. So when they see a job opportunity that fits your description, they bring it to you, and congratulations, you've done nothing to earn this job, but somehow you found a job. Or the complete other side of the spectrum, a very active job search, right? You wake up in the morning, it's basically your job is the searching of a job, right? Nine o'clock in the morning to 5 p.m. in the afternoon, you're sending in applications, you're editing your resume, you're working on your cover letter, right? Your, your job is the job search. And so where are we supposed to be as Christians who love the Lord, specifically looking towards Christ coming back, but also just in our lives, in our everyday, we find ourselves waiting quite frequently, quite often. And I think the answer is somewhere in the middle, right? That we're not too active because when we are so active, we often forget to, in our sinfulness and brokenness, we overlook and we forget that God is the provider, right? Especially in this area, in this culture, in this time. We are so hard pressed to provide for ourselves that when all you do is provide for yourself every single time, every single day, then how do you think about it? Consider it in your life. How do you know the Lord as provider? Is it even a foreign concept to you that he is the one who provides even the daily bread for you in your day, in your life? And so if you're too active, there are sinful things that could happen. Uh, you could become way too possessive, way too material, way too self-centered, but also if you're too passive, then I mean that one is kind of self-explanatory, right? You're just too lazy. Uh, you are the one that kind of just sits back, hands off, and you say, no, the Lord will bring it to me in his timing, right? And we might say to our friends that are on the couch waiting for the jobs to come to them, we say, the Lord's given you hands and feet and a brain that you're supposed to use, right? <laughs> towards looking for a job and towards doing these things. And so somewhere in the middle is probably a healthy place to find ourselves. So the main idea for this morning, if you take nothing home, then maybe this summary is good for you. The people of God are to actively wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The people of God are to actively wait for the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of the first question to think about this morning here. How prepared are you for Jesus Christ to come back? How prepared are you? for Jesus Christ to come back. And I know it might be kind of a strange question, right? You're like, I, I don't know, what, what do you mean by that, right? But basically this, do you think about Jesus coming back at all? Does his return motivate you or change or impact the way that you live at all? How does his return affect you, if at all? Right? And so how prepared are you, how aware are you of Jesus Christ coming back? Like we talked about last week, knowing the end helps us to live in the middle, helps us to live today. But today we're looking at it in a little bit of a different angle. As we wait today, how are we to live our lives? And so furthermore, how familiar are you with work? Right? 
How familiar are you with work? Do you know what it means to work? Have you worked before? Even what kind of perspective or outlook do you have on work in general? What kind of work do you do in your life? Do you view work as positive or negative? What is your consideration of work? How consciously do you live as a servant today that is waiting and working for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back? This is the identity that's put before us in Matthew 25 and that we might examine a little bit more closely. And so the first way that you see this, there's only two points, right? Two passages, two parables that we work through in our text this morning. The first point is this. We are to wait expectantly. We are to wait in expectation, right? We wait expectantly. And this is, again, part of the people of God are to actively wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you see this in the first parable, verses 1 through 13 of Matthew 25. So if you have your Bibles, look in Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13, and I'll I'll read aloud. Verse 1. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy the oil, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut." Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. We are to wait expectantly, right? We are to wait in preparation even of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. And so go back to verse one and let's walk through a little bit. So verse one, uh, a little bit of context for this kind of parable. Uh, This is another one of several warning parables. It's part of the Olivet Discourse of Jesus Christ that we talked about Uh, in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25. It's referenced as the Olivet Discourse as Jesus kind of warns and, and talks about the future coming, his future return to his disciples and to the people who are gathered. And so he's fleshing out, he's explaining the truth that the exact time of his second coming will not be known in advance, right? We talked about this even last week, but also we see more of it today. The purpose of this parable of the 10 virgins seems to be to accentuate or to highlight the incredible importance of being spiritually prepared to meet Jesus when he returns to earth. Because after his return, we will have no longer further chance for salvation. Right? And so the purpose of this parable it seems to be to accentuate or to emphasize or to highlight the incredible importance of being spiritually ready to meet Jesus when he comes back to earth. Because after his return, we will no longer have further chance for salvation. So further context also as we talk about the ten virgins parable here. Uh, it's talking about a Jewish wedding ceremony, especially back then in the ancient Near East. That's kind of what we reference to, to the time, the place, the culture of Jesus' time on earth, the ancient Near East. A wedding was the most celebrated social event in most parts of the ancient Near East. Virtually, everyone in a village or a neighborhood for a wedding would be involved as a participant or a guest. It was a time of great happiness and great festivity. So the wedding ceremony was a very big deal. And in verse one, you're introduced to the 10 characters, the 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Therefore, it's customary, the 10 virgins would have been the 10 bridesmaids. It was the custom of that day that bridesmaids would be chaste young women who had never been married before. And so these these 10 bridesmaids would go to meet the bridegroom during this time of wedding ceremony, a time of great celebration and great expectations. So they're friends of the bride, essentially, right? If, if you're reading this today in 2024 and you're like, oh, that's weird. Why are we talking about 10 virgins this morning here at church? Right? That's the context, the cultural context of what's going on. And so in verse 2, you're immediately introduced to the character of some of these or all of these bridesmaids. Five were foolish, but five were wise. 
Interesting, isn't it, the division that's presented before us here, even immediately. Is it an arbitrary number? Five were foolish and five were wise, right? Did Jesus just say, ah, I don't know, just pick a random number, one through ten? Or might Jesus be even making a commentary by evenly dividing the expected bridesmaids for the wedding, for the celebration? If you consider it this morning, which of these two groups of people might you belong to? The foolish or the wise? Praise God, however, because he is never content to live, leave his people to their foolishness, but actually he commands us regarding wisdom. Wisdom is to be desired, wisdom is to be available, and wisdom is to be pursued. Right? And so although we might identify as foolish this morning, that we're not supposed to stay there. James 1, chapter 5, if any of you lasts, lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and wisdom will be given him. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge or wisdom, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20, listen to advice and accept instruction in order that you might gain wisdom in the future. So listen, O children of God, the heart of God your Father is never that you might simply categorize yourself as one of the foolish or one of the wise, but that in this life you might ever desire and pursue His wisdom that is openly available to you in Christ Jesus in the word of life. Right? And so we are to grow in wisdom, but unfortunately today in the parable there's five foolish and five who are wise. And in verses 3 through 4, look at what the foolish and the wise do. The foolish take no oil with their lamps, and the wise take flasks of oil with their lamps. So what distinguishes, what is the difference between the foolish and the wise here in this parable in these verses? In speaking of being prepared for the groom being prepared to meet the bridegroom when he's coming, right? Being prepared even as a parable for the return of Christ our King. The difference between the foolish and the wise as they wait is this. The preparation, the consideration, or perhaps even more important, their possession, right? And so that's what separates them. The foolish are not prepared. The foolish have not considered. The foolish do not possess the oil. But the wise have prepared. The wise have considered. And the wise do possess the oil. So walk through these for a little bit. Again, keep in mind the main idea that Jesus is referring to and through our passage today. The people of God are to actively wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, when we talk about being prepared, having properly considered what is to come, and also having possession, do we have the oil or do we not? Perhaps these five bridesmaids who were foolish, ill-prepared, failed to consider, perhaps even these five foolish bridesmaids, uh, they had good intentions, right? Maybe you say, well, they still showed up, did they not? Perhaps you can even see a form or an outward appearance of the foolish of godliness, the appearance of faith, right? That whether you're foolish or wise, they all came, right? But when they came, only five of them were prepared. Only five of them possessed the oil and the other five didn't, right? What was missing? What was missing is the light, right? What was missing was life. I hope, if nothing else, by this point in our Matthew study, that you have been able to notice and see that the focus of Jesus Christ our King is not on the performative actions or the mere attending of the wedding feast, but His focus is greatly focused on you and I's hearts, the inward spiritual reality, a real and genuine commitment to Christ, not just merely one that looks like it. Right? It's not just about looking like a bridesmaid, but it's about the internal reality of are you committed to Christ the groom truly and genuinely. So in verse 5, continue on in the parable, there's a delay. There's a delay in the coming of the groom. And so all the bridesmaids became drowsy and fell asleep. Finally, a Bible verse in scripture we can relate to, right? Becoming drowsy and falling asleep. 
Just making sure no one's sleeping. I actually didn't check, so if you're sleeping, you're actually you're, you're pretty good. Uh, but did you know also in the Bible that there is a guy named Eutychus, famous Eutychus, Acts chapter 20. If you know anything about this guy, he falls asleep while Paul the Apostle is teaching, and it's a long teaching. I, I think Scripture says something like, they gathered either for breakfast or lunch, and Paul the Apostle kept going until midnight, right? <laughs> until midnight. Uh, and so the, this guy named Eutychus falls asleep during a sermon. He falls out of a window. He dies, actually, listening to Paul the Apostle preach. And, and then he's brought back to life by Paul. Moral of the story, don't listen to sermons by windows. Right? No, no the moral, sometimes people get sleepy. Okay, it is what it is. Maybe you didn't sleep well last night. Maybe you had a long week. It's okay, I'd never fault you for falling asleep. God faults you. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Uh, well, it kind of makes sense, right? And so you're thinking about this, and at verse 5, even at a slight, slightly deeper level, the foolish sleep and the wise sleep. They both fall asleep, and it kind of makes sense. Uh, why should the wise not sleep? They, they have their oil. They're prepared, right? They're in possession. They sleep in peace, right? They can fall asleep. When the bridegroom comes, they ha they're ready to go and meet the bridegroom. But also notice that the foolish fall asleep just as well. And herein you can notice the danger of foolishness, being led astray in false confidence. You might say, eh, what does Pastor John know? He's probably just trying to recruit more people to serve in church. Or you might say, eh, my life isn't that bad right now. I'll be okay. I'll figure it out, right? Eh, I'll figure it out when I get to it. There's more than enough time. And so the foolish fall asleep in the parable, just as the foolish fall asleep today in our lives. If only the foolish would realize that they are not prepared, that they know not the hour of Christ the groom's return, that they would not sleep, but rather that they would work, try to find the oil, figure out a means to be able to sleep in peace even, secure in possession and consideration of what is to come. Right? If only the foolish would realize. And so in verse 6, after they all fall asleep, the groom finally appears at midnight. Quite the hour of the appearing of the groom. Quite unexpected. The middle of the night for most people. Well, I guess it's the middle of the night for all people, even if you're nocturnal like myself. Uh, for myself, midnight is probably the peak hour. It's when I'm the most awake or most alive. I mentioned this before. Maybe one day we'll have a midnight service. It would be quite interesting. Who would attend? Like three people, right? <laughs> three, three people would be here at midnight on, on a, for a service. But again, midnight is when the groom appears. When we least expect it, Christ will return without warning and without further chances. Right? That should appropriately sober you up that right now we live under so much grace, so much grace. Right? You can do something and then repent. You can come to the cross and confess your sin every Sunday. But one day there will be no longer a chance for repentance. There will be no more chances. Grace will run out at that day. And in verse 8, when the grace has run out, the foolish ask for oil from the wise. We weren't prepared for this. Please share with us some of your oil. And in verse 9, the wise are not able to share. You didn't bring your own. Maybe you're able to buy it if you are quick enough. And in verse 10, as the foolish go to buy, the bridegroom comes. And again, God has his own schedule for everything. It doesn't always look like our schedule. More times than not, God's schedule looks completely different than our schedule. It's not just the return of Christ. As humans, we can't claim to know the fullness of God's schedule and God's timing, right? We're broken. We're limited. And so we do the very next best thing, which is what? Being prepared, waiting ready, so that when his timing comes, we are able to follow, right? When he opens the door, that we're able to walk through. And in verse 10, those who were prepared make it into the marriage feast and the door is shut. In verse 11, the foolish say, please open up. And verse 12, the groom replies, I do not know you, right? Get away, leave. And when you read this, does it strike you as cruel, right? When you read this and the groom says, I do not know you, you think, why doesn't he just open the door, 
right? Why, how could he be so mean to these bridegrooms? They just didn't have oil. And again, it reminds us of our hyper fixation that we have as sinful human beings. We literally forget everything we just read through and studied. The foolish took no oil with them. The foolish sleep content falsely confident through and through there were incredible number of chances for the foolish to become wise but the sinful and consistent rejection of wisdom by the foolish has led them to where they are now and so therefore the groom says i'm sorry you are an outsider you're not one of mine if you had cared you would not have acted the way that you did and so therefore you can't come in Verse 13, therefore watch, you know neither the day nor the hour. Again, it's a parable of the Lord's return. And so waiting expectantly, waiting while being prepared and for being secured, right? This idea of waiting of, while having all of these things in check. If you're anything like me, perhaps you struggle sometimes with procrastination. My high school and my college years were quite uh, terrible. There's no other word for it. Uh, my motto was, do tomorrow, do tomorrow, if, you, if you're familiar with that. <laughs> right? My homework was very rarely, if ever, homework, actually. It was more like schoolwork or the next day at schoolwork. Right? And so I rarely ever did my work at home. Uh, if you're youth or you're college listening to this and you're saying, well, Pastor John did it. No, no. Okay. Bad, don't say that. Do as I say, not as I do, right? Uh, no, but in all seriousness, instead of procrastination, instead of foolishness, instead of failing over and over and over again to listen and to surrender and accept, what else is possible for us in our lives? Wisdom, right? Wisdom. Don't leave for tomorrow when tomorrow is not even promised. Maybe it's not that bad to turn in one homework assignment late for a participation grade, I don't know, 2% of your overall grade. But when it comes to your salvation, right? When it comes down to your eternal security, that you know not what happens when you die, you know not what happens tomorrow, even when Jesus comes back without warning, and you think, ah, next Sunday, I'll give it to until next Sunday, and everything ends before next Sunday. And so do you have the oil? Did you take the oil? The groom will come when you least expect it. Are you ready and are you prepared to meet him in wisdom? Are you actively ready, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ? And so that's the first parable and we have a little bit left. And so look at verses 14 through 30. The second point, we are to work in our waiting we are to work in our waiting. And so this builds furthermore on the idea of the active waiting that we are to have as God's people as we look forward toward the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verses 14 through 30, it's a little bit long, so we're just going to work through it uh, and just follow along uh, as we go verse by verse. But it's talking about the parable of the talents. In verse 14, a master entrusts to his talents his own property. Verse 15, each servant is entrusted with a certain amount of talents according to his ability. It's interesting, isn't it, right? One gets five, one gets two, and another one. But in verse 15, it says word for word, each according to his ability. The master knows his servants well enough to distribute to them according and, gi and giving to what they are able to handle. Nothing more and nothing less. This is the wisdom and the knowledge of the master. The emphasis here on this parable is not supposed to be on money, right? And so if you walk away thinking, oh, today I was talking about an investment sermon, right? What, how can I make money for the Lord? That's not correct, okay? Uh, but talent here is referring to some monetary amount, sure, but also a talent is a unit of measurement. So perhaps it's even left intentionally unexplained financially. For example, a talent of gold would be quite a large sum, right? A talent of silver would be less so and a talent of copper or bronze would be even less valuable than all of those. And so the focus here is not money. It's not made clear to us, but the focus is individual accountability, individual responsibility, all of this according to ability, all of this according to ability. And in verse 16, the servant who received five, look at what he does. He receives five talents at once and he goes and trades with them and he makes five talents more, right? Wow. Impressive, isn't it? This person who was dealt five talents immediately goes and he makes five more. He doubles it. 
And he doesn't give it to the next person, he gives it back to the master. Right? It's impressive, well done servant, but also when you're considering how amazing this servant is, don't fail to notice the master who knew that this servant could handle five talents. And so this master in his wisdom gives him exactly how much he could handle and he doubles the amounts. Five turns to 10. And so also look in verse 17. Two talents given turned into two more. But in verse 18, one who received a single talent, he digs a hole in the ground and he hides the money of the master. And in verse 19, a long time had passed and the master finally returns to check in on the progress of his money and his servants. And in verse 20, five became ten. Verse 21, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and so I will set you over much. And it's the same thing in verse 21 through 23 for the two talent servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I trusted you with two, and you have turned it into double. And pause here for a second. Do you find yourself reflecting these genuine servants of the master? Do you find yourself handling well what the Lord God has given you and even doubling it for his purpose, for his service, for his service, for returning it back to him. Do you have a supreme desire in your life to serve God, nothing greater, to love your master, the Lord your God, with all your heart and all your soul and all your might? And look at even how the master compliments the good servants, right? Look at this. It's not about their accomplishments or what they did or how much money they made or how much they brought back. The master doesn't say, oh, good job, you've doubled my investment. Right? He doesn't say, good job, now I am considerably wealthier than I was before. The master says, well done, my good and my faithful servants. He affirms and he focuses on their attitude, their character, not just their accomplishments, right? not just what they have done. And furthermore, what else? Good job, the master says, but also the master says, enter into the joy of your master. What a reward. Right? Don't miss it. Enter into the joy of your master. That's the kind of opportunity that the master gives to these servants. He says, well done, my good and faithful servants. Now come on in. Right? Experience my joy. Experience what it means to be around me. And so these two faithful servants, what a reward. They've successfully carried out the trust and the gift from the master, and they're rewarded as such. And again, pick back up in verse 24. There is this one person we left out of the parable, one person who received one talent, and he comes and he says, Master, I know that you are a hard man. You reap where you did not sow. You gather where you scattered no seed. I was afraid, and so therefore here is your one talent back that you trusted me with. And in verse 26 through 27, the master responds in anger to the accusations. The accusations don't even make sense, the master says. If you knew that I was mean and evil and would take what did not even belong to me, then why didn't you just invest my money in the bank? That's what he says. Instead of burying it, so even in interest would be, would be possible to accumulate and to earn, right? He says, you could have done even the bare minimum, but you didn't. In your selfishness and in your self-focus, you only thought about what you had in your mind, in your head, and in your heart, and you buried my talent, and you failed to invest it and, and be faithful with it. So in verse 28, the master says, take from the wicked servant and give to the good and faithful servant. In verse 29, everyone who has more will be given. The one who has not will be taken away. The wicked servant, verse 30, will be cast out into inner darkness, filled with weeping and gnashing of teeth. When Christ returns, the master will take away from those merely physically located in the church whose hearts and lives do not truly belong to him. For those that say, I've received your talent, Lord. Yeah, I'm kind of, the Bible's good. Uh, faith is okay. Uh, the sermons are good, but I, I'm not going to build on it. I'm not going to take the talent that I receive. I'm just going to hold on to it, and I'll just give it back to you at the end of the day. And the master says that these will be taken away from the hearts and lives. They don't truly belong to him. And great will be the blessing, greater will be the blessing of those who are found truly in Christ Jesus. For a while, it might be possible to blend in as one of God's people. But when push comes to shove, when the master comes back, the attitude and the accomplishments of his people will show whether or not they belong truly to him. And there's a kind of a confusing, a per perplexing uh, part of this parable that we didn't touch yet. And look at this. The wicked servant 
does acknowledge his master appropriately in verse 24. The wicked servant says, Master. And so he acknowledges his master, and yet he fails to carry out what he had been trusted with. And so we arrive at this conclusion. Mere acknowledgement, mere knowledge of the master is not enough. Even the demons know, the Bible says. The demons know and they acknowledge that Jesus Christ is king, and even they tremble. tremble. It's not about acknowledgement or knowledge that Christ is king, but here and in our lives, Jesus is talking about proper stewardship, right? Stewardship. With what you have been given, what are you doing with it? How will you be faithful with what you have been trusted? Listen to this quote. In much the same way as the wicked servant, today many unbelieving church members exist who live in the environment of God's redeemed community and enjoy exposure to the teaching of his word and to the fellowship and community of his people. But in spite of in spite of their spiritual privilege and blessing, they make no positive response to the gospel and therefore they fail in stewardship. They render no fruitful service back unto the Lord. How much have you been trusted with? How many sermons, how many small groups, how many Bible studies, how many retreats, how many blessings and privileges have you been around and what have you done with all that the Lord has given to you and placed you around, right? How faithful have you been with what the Lord God has put in your life, right? Do you just think that it's for you, for yourself? No, right? The, the, the faithful servants double the investment faithfully of the master and give it back to him as an offering, as work, as sacrifice. How faithful have you been in your life? How faithful are you currently in your life with what you have been trusted? I say this all the time. Yes, I believe the Lord has created me strong in some ways regarding my thinking or my ability, but also I am, I'm weak in some ways regarding my thinking and my ability. I'm very weak, but also so much more than that, so much more than the way that I was made. I have been so incredibly blessed in my life to have been around good people, good places, and good teaching. I, I'm just a product of the places that the Lord has led me. Not all the time, okay, so I've definitely been around my fair share of bad and unhelpful places and people and teaching, but I say this all the time. I think and I reason the way that I do because of my mentor pastor who faithfully discipled me month after month, year after year when I was in college. I handle my finances the way that I do because of the radical generosity and giving and help that was given to me by a Christian mother and father who just simply ran a cafe in Tyson's 2 that I worked at. You have two realities before you. Which is more important to God? A pastor or a mom and dad who own a cafe and love the Lord, not only with their lips or their minds, but, but with also their heart and their actions. And how you answer this question says a lot about how you consider your faith before the Lord. Because the reality is, without this faithful, God-loving couple, this pastor would not exist today. Right? I would not have been able to go to school. I would not have been able to, to have a car to drive around in. Right? But the faithfulness of two of God's laymen, individuals who work every single day, nine to five, longer than that even, longer than that, their faithfulness led to even my ability to come and to serve at this church. Some of you, the Lord will send overseas. Some of you may be in history books or textbooks or be in higher positions of power. And yet even more, and some of you will, may work construction for the rest of your life. Some of you, maybe your entire claim to fame will be this. I raised my one or two or three child or children to the best of my ability. It's not about whether you have one talent or five, but it is about how you steward, how you use, how you care, love, sacrifice, and serve with what you have been given and what you have been entrusted with. We eagerly wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is this kind of active stewardship waiting. The profit earned by the first two servants represents the accomplishment and satisfaction of a life that belongs to the Lord and is faithfully dedicated to his service. Does this life reflect your life? 
the failure of the third and the wicked servant to use that which, with which he had been entrusted by his master represents a fake, hopeless, and empty life in which the profession of Christ, faith in Christ is proved false and is meaningless by the careless waste of privilege and opportunity. And so is your faith fake and hopeless and empty? Is your profession of faith in Christ false and meaningless by the careless waste of the privilege and opportunity that the Lord has given you in this life? The people of God are to actively wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Last week, we talked a lot about the future coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, we focus a little bit more on what we are to do in the meantime, what we are to do in the middle. Working is good. Being a steward is good. We focus on the day by day, the moment by moment, and this is so important. It's so key. If you walk away with nothing else, right, maybe this question, how can I glorify God faithfully and truly where he has put me today? To who? To where? And how can I glorify him? Whether it's by feeding your son, whether it's by loving your spouse, Right? Whether it's by teaching, whether it's by serving, whatever it looks like, whether it's by picking up a piece of trash on the ground, how can I glorify Christ faithfully and truly where he has put me today? Let's pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you so much for this word. Lord, we thank you for your word, your word that is good. Lord, we thank you for your grace that is still abundant today. Lord, you did not come back even in the middle of our sermon. You did not come back even as we finished talking about your word. And so all of the people gathered here right now have the grace, the chance, the opportunity to turn our lives around and to put our faith and trust in you, Lord Jesus, that we might not be the foolish who are not ready, who do not know what's coming, who are not prepared, but Lord, that we might be the wise, that we... We might not know all the answers. We might not have all the answers. And yet we know this, that you are the master and that we are not. And so, Lord God, we pray and we ask that you would teach us and grow us in these ways. Help us, God, to be faithful with what you have given us, with what you have entrusted to us. Lord, may we be those good and those faithful servants who faithfully work with what you have given us, not desiring more, not desiring less, but fully trusting in a good and faithful master who knows us perfectly. And so we're able to work with what we are given all to the glory of you, Lord Jesus. Help us to glorify you with our daily and moment by moment choices and lives. And so we pray all of this in Jesus' precious name.
Uh, Father God, worthy are you, worthy are you. Lord, help us to not just be words that we sing on Sundays, but Lord, that we live it out with our lives, that we live it out with our sacrifices, that we live it out with our actions, truly how worthy you are. Lord, the way that we live reflects how worthy we truly think you are. And so help us, Lord, to consider you truly worthy of everything and to live our lives in a way that reflects it. And so, Lord, uh, we lift up this offering to you. We use it uh, to advance your kingdom, to build uh, the gospel. And, Lord, we just we lift it to you and give it to you. We need your help. Lord, for all of this, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please be seated. We just have some announcements for us to run through. Uh, so, first, before we get into any announcements, we had uh, the youth group open house night where we invited the youth group, invited their, kid, their friends who uh, some, some didn't go to church, some went to other things. And so, uh, we did that on Friday, uh, so last night. We did it on Friday nights, and uh, it went well. We got some really good feedback from a lot of people, so thank you if you were a part of that at all, whether it's from the PTA, the youth group leadership, you know, whatever, if you just invited your friends. Uh, we're really thankful for how it went, and we're, we're hoping and we're still praying that God would use uh, you know, the efforts that we all put in uh, and multiply it even more. So uh, just a quick thank you for that. And our first announcement is the SFC retreat is coming up. It's near the end of July. Uh, if you want to go, uh, the registration is open. All of these links and these announcements are found on the QR code on your bulletin on the back. You can just scan it, uh, and it'll take you there as well, along some other couple links. Second announcement, our VBS is going to be in the beginning of August, from the August 5th through 8th, Monday through Thursday. So please continue to pray for all these. Next announcement, the EM Adult Bible Study today is canceled. We're starting this thing where every fourth Sunday, we're just trying to cancel our Bible studies across the board, and so we're trying to have a time of fellowship and increase community uh, amongst each other. So today, uh, just go down to the after service, gather together, have some conversations, uh, deepen relationships, and go out together for a bite to eat. There's no food, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, go get some fall or something. Uh, next announcements. Uh, we're looking for more help in education ministry. If you're willing to teach and you're interested in these, right? Again, being faithful with what you have been entrusted. Uh, you don't have to be talented. You don't have to be great, right? You just have to have a willing heart. And so we would love to work with you, to train you, to equip you, uh, so that you're able to serve as a teacher, a teacher's assistant, whatever kind of ministry opportunity we have. We have a lot of help that is needed, and so. Uh, we trust me, we'll find a place for you. So just have a conversation with us, uh, and we would love to help you get started. Next announcement, we're trying to start up our next round of Garden Church membership classes. So if you've been attending Garden Church as a guest, or if you haven't taken a membership class, we would love for you to commit to the local body as an involved member. And so please speak with me or an elder, and we're, we're, we're trying to. We have one, possibly two, are, are just waiting for a little bit more members to join in. So. Uh, please be praying over this, and please feel free to let us know. But I think that's all the announcements that we have today. So if you would just rise as we uh, finish out our service with the benediction. May the love of God the Father, the presence and the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, and the grace and the consistency uh, and just the presence of Christ the Son be with you all as you leave this place.